Is that okay? That's fine. Good. Thank well, you. first, thank you for being here. I was here last year also at the 20th celebration of the fall of the, the wall, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here since then. I was asked by Mark Dunfrey to be a member on the advisory board of the uh, institute, for which I'm very happy. Um, my topic is going to be on the Convention for Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And of course, we've, I'm sure that we, we would all agree that of course it's so much better to have prevention than to have punishment. Unfortunately, the first part of my speech will be about what happened and therefore where it should be punished. Um, it's my belief also having spent about 30 years among criminals the most of my time, I know that prevention is very difficult. So um, uh, to influence the human behavior is really a very difficult thing. Uh, we have heard uh, a lot about war in the first speech today. And um, something that is really striking is that war is not a crime. War is not forbidden. We even have uh, what we call law of wars, for instance, that when you take prisoners during a war, you are um, obliged to, to treat them in a certain decent manner. But it never says anywhere that law is forbidden. Now, genocide, I'm sure most of you know what it is. Uh, it derives from Latin, the word uh, geno, uh, meaning people, and side, citus, minus uh, killing. So it's killing of people. And I'll go back to um, the definition later. But first, I'll give you a little survey about the genocides in the 20th century, which um, started by the beginning of 1900. The first genocide came into, uh, uh, happened just a few years after the century started. That was in uh, 1904, and it was actually um, in the German Southwest Africa, what is now called Namibia, uh, where the Herero people, uh, who were the occupied people, they started a rebellion because um, the Germans wanted to have a, a railway right across what is now Namibia, which would uh, spoil the, the uh, living of the inhabitants because um, they couldn't take their cattle uh, around because of, the, of this. And at the in the first place, the heroes the actually succeeded because possibly no one expected uh, any kind of uprise. So um, the Germans, which was to expect, uh, who, were, uh, who had a great nation behind them, they came to um, as Southwest Africa, and um, they killed a lot of people, and they did what we should see later, that they actually captured them and drove them into the desert and put up barriers, guards, so that the people couldn't come back, so they would die from exhaustion, hunger, and thirst, I think. You die from thirst in the first place. Um, and it is uh, estimated that 80% of the Herero people uh, were killed in this way. So that really was a genocide. At the time when the communication wasn't very big, I suppose not many people heard about it. Then there was the genocide of the Armenian population in the Osman Empire in 1914. That should give a much um, a greater impact upon the history. It was the Osman Empire who wanted to kind of clean the empire so that it was only for the Turks. And therefore, the, they invaded a lot of the Armenian villages. They drove the people out. 
And again, you saw the picture because it's easier if you can put a people in a place where they just stop. Uh, and they were driven into the um, into the desert also, uh, the desert you have in the north of, of Iraq. And um, so uh, there was again these guards and um, the people died there. It's uh, estimated that uh, between 1 and 1.5 Armenians were killed in that way. Now, when you look upon the program that I'm sure you had also before you came here, and at least what you have just had now, you will see the name of a person called Ralph, Ralph Lemkin. I'll come back to him because this uh, genocide of the Armenian population really was kind of the trigger to use that word again uh, for the convention being created. But of course there have been others. There have been one that I'm sure you all know about even if you are so young, namely the Holocaust by the Nazis during the Second World War. Um, it's estimated that six million uh, people were killed uh, by the Nazis, and it's just such an overwhelming amount. And of course, uh, that was a genocide also. But at the same time, just over a little longer time, you had what uh, you have uh, to consider what happened in the Soviet uh, Union or the Soviet Republic, whatever you call it, because that was the era after the. Uh, Saar uh, was, uh, uh, was taken away in 1917, then the communists came first, Lenin uh, and Stalin, and you all have heard about he deported friends and enemies, really. No one could ever be, be certain in the Soviet Union, and people were deported, especially to the Gulag, which is in the Siberia, where they were forced workers, so if they didn't starve from exhaustion and hunger, they would starve from the cold, they would starve from the cold. But still, it was not a peaceful world. Uh, you all have heard about the rape Khmer's in Cambodia. That was led by uh, Pol Pot, and um, uh, it's, um, it was also a disaster close to what you have saw in, uh, in by the Nazis in, this, in the Soviet Republic. It was during a period of just four years, but it estimated that 1.7 million uh, persons were killed by the, uh, by the uh, Khmer's. Again, it was a class uh, with communists and um, a lot of suppression. And then, as you all know, we have the Tutsis in Rwanda. Uh, there was an uproar, a, a rebellion uh, also there. And um, the uh, government, uh, with the help of a lot of more or less private armies, they uh, killed, and it's supposed that they killed, um, they killed the people in uh, Rwanda uh, just in April 1994, as I have written here, and in the course of just 100 days, 100 days, about three months, about 800 Tutsis were killed. And you probably know it was just a, a, an awful thing to read about that uh, very often the soldiers or the rebellions, they couldn't kill people just by shooting them, so they would uh, cut the, the ankles uh, with the machete knives and then come back later and kill people because then they couldn't walk. Atrocities and atrocities. And then in the ex-Yugoslavia, you also, uh, which you know, had um, genocides, and especially I think it's very often in these, these cases that there's one specific uh, incident that would call your attention, and I think that during that time, it was uh, uh, what happened at Srebrenica, 
and I'll come back to that later. So um, are there genocides in the 21st century? Yes, I should say there are. Uh, in Sudan, there has been an ongoing conflict. It's still going on, and it's said, when will it ever end? And um, one must say, well, um, it probably ends when the uh, great countries want it to end, when they have something at stake. But at the moment, it still uh, lingers on. Um, there are many uh, reports about what happens that first the government make a bombardment uh, from a bomb storm, and after that the local milits go into uh, Darfur. What about the, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo? It was just last Friday on the 29th of October that uh, there was a, a report was uh, presented in, in Geneva stating um, a lot of atrocities and also being met, not unexpectedly, by protest by many African countries who said that it was untrue what was in uh, this report. When I say, uh, are there uh, genocides in the 21st uh, century, then I have to say that these that I'm now mentioning, they have not been tried uh, by any court so far. But there are investigations also about what happens in Afghanistan. And if you look upon it, then you will see that uh, in any time we go back a very long time, because it's not just that there's a genocide a fortnight ago and then it comes into, um, into a court, like for instance, say, with, with a bank robbery or anything like that. It's, uh, it's usually that at least 10 years happens before the responsible will be tried at a, um, at a court. And then I have uh, asked the question, are there any, are there any more? And uh, certainly there will be, uh, you heard something about it just before, where we can maybe expect what about Bangladesh, what about Pakistan, we'll have to see. Now when we speak about genocides, it uh, would be very um, interesting to say who are the perpetrators, who are the people who commit uh, genocide. Well, then of course it's, uh, it's evident that it's not just one person and uh, it probably is only very seldom that it's the head of state or the journals that um, are the perpetrators. They are, but, but there are many groups of people. Of course, there are the general, the warlords and the head of states. I would linger at these three ones because they are some of the people who have been uh, or, and who are being tried uh, at the ICC in The Hague, the International Criminal Court, and also at the ex-Yugoslavian court in The Hague. Um, and what is the usual excuse? Well, we know about, um, for instance, um, Milosevic, who said, well, I didn't know what happened. I wasn't there. I didn't have com uh, command of these people who committed all the atrocities. And therefore, many of these cases about, uh, against the first uh, free in the group, they have been very difficult because no one wanted to take the responsibility. The, uh, the standing was, yes, I, uh, I was the, the high commander in this uh, uh, war, but since I started by, off by stating that war is not illegal, it's just something that happens, and I tend to be a little ironical here, but uh, what they can say is, but we didn't know, we were not the ones who asked uh, the victims to dig an enormous grave stand at the edge of it, and after that shot about six or seven thousand men and uh, young boys. And this is what many of these cases, when they are brought, uh, brought, brought to tri trial, very often is, you know it from the Nuremberg process, I can see that all of you are younger than uh, when that was tried. 
after the Nazis. And nearly without exemptions, all the people who were tried said, we didn't know anything about what happened. It was not our responsibility. So who is it that do these things? Well, of course, mostly it's soldiers. But very often also you know that behind the soldier stands another soldier who will be um, willing, able to, and probably also willing, to kill the one who doesn't obey the orders. So, of course, most of them are soldiers. They are the ones who directly commit the genocides. But um, the court in, in The Hague has taken the view that they are not being tried. No matter how gruesome or how masochistic the single soldier was, it's never the soldiers who are being tried. Um, and that maybe is, is also a very reasonable thing. Then, of course, it's the police, especially in the states where the police has a paramilitary role. Then uh, it could also be the police who did it. And then what we know from the, from, uh, the concentration camps during the Second World War, very often uh, doctors who are, have a very easy access to kill people by injections or by other means, they would be the ones who did it directly. I um, also point, point, uh, point out, just to give you an example of one of those uh, who are the perpetrators, well, of course, I've uh, mentioned uh, Slobodan Milosevic just a moment ago. It's Pol Pot from Cambodia. It's Charles Taylor. And in order to be a bit populistic, if you don't know Charles Taylor from anything else, then you know that he gave some stones, precious or not, to uh, Naomi Campbell, and uh, that was uh, very much in the papers. But that, I must say, is really not so irrelevant. Um, uh, relevant is that he was a dictator in um, uh, the former, pre former president in Liberia, and um, he was put on the seal at the 7th of March in 2003. And why I'm telling you this is just to see how uh, long time it takes after you have a an warrant of arrest until you have a person. Because it was not until March 2006 that he was arrested and taken to, to uh, The Hague. When I say taken to The Hague, um, I must tell you that all these uh, people who are being uh, addicted, they are not necessarily in The Hague. It's a bit uh, secret where they are, uh, but they are probably somewhere in Europe, and some of them at least are in The Hague. The case itself started in uh, January 2008. And with, because of my profession, I, I was in The Hague and um, uh, was also at a trial where you have a lot of, of security. You have, you have glass uh, from the ceiling down to the floor, uh, which of course is unbreakable. It's not people like that who might shoot uh, Charles Taylor, but probably a lot of other people would like to do so. And this case, as you can understand, is still not finished. So it really takes a long, long time to have uh, people tried. In a moment, I'll turn, I'll turn to the uh, courts and um, where the courts to uh, prosecute these uh, genocides are. Uh, but first, I wrote uh, about a person uh, called uh, Georgic versus Germany. I brought this because, after all, we are here in Germany, even if we are international. And he was tried at um, the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal. Uh, and he was tried because he was, um, he was a national. He wasn't a German national. He was a, a national of Bosnia Herze uh, and Herzegovina. He was of Serb or uh, Serbian origin and was born in Bosnia. He stayed legally in Germany. And um, 
he was uh, <clears throat> imprisoned. He had a life imprison imprisonment because he was uh, uh, convicted of having committed acts of genocide during the ethnic cleansing in Dubai in September 1992. Now, why is this one interesting? Well, it's interesting because man was given imprisonment for life because um, um, in the, as you know, the civilized countries, uh, you don't have a death penalty. But the interesting thing was that really the crime in itself had no connection to Germany whatsoever. This is why I gave you all these nationalities. It was only that he had a legal right to stay in Germany and then he was arrested when he was here. Now, the case uh, was interesting because it was taken to the uh, Court of Human Rights um, in Strasbourg because he said there was not jurisdiction. What had it to do with Düsseldorf? But the, the International Court of Human Rights rejected it and said, well, it is an international crime and therefore uh, it can be sentenced. Uh, Denmark has the same view, and I brought you a number of pamphlets. In uh, They are in uh, English and they are in French, and you can uh, get them from Marianne, who sits uh, here, if you want to see what we can do in Denmark, because we think in Denmark we have the same very broad uh, legislation. So if we, if we have the resources to cope with such a big case, we uh, uh, can arrest anyone who comes to Denmark. We had an example which shows that maybe we are not in the most effective um, society because an Iraqi, former Iraqi general, was arrested in Denmark. And uh, since it was um, supposed that he would have to stay in this pre preliminary detention for a couple of years, he had some very lenient conditions and suddenly one morning he left the prison. And uh, he has not been seen in Denmark or probably not anywhere in the world since. Well, now I come to the Convention of Prevention and Punishment uh, of Genocide. And first I'm going to say a little bit historically about it because there was a Polish lawyer, a Jew by the way, Ralph Lemkin, he kind of foresaw, maybe by intuition, what was going to happen. And he was very upward about what happened in Armenia, about the Armenian genocide. And so he wrote an essay back in 1933, when the German uh, government was uh, burnt, the building was burnt. And, but that has nothing to do with that. Uh, he wrote an essay called crime of barbarity. And that was all about the Armenian genocide. Now, being a Jew, and uh, it was obvious that he and his family living in Poland was very threatened. He managed to get away, but most of his family uh, was killed. Uh, having entered the United States, he uh, had a lot of efforts in order to, in order to, um, well, I'm just, I'm just smiling a bit because now it's being said that I don't have any more time. So, uh, but I'll do as my predecessor, I'll stick to this table. Well, <laughs> anyway, he was, there's no doubt that he was the ghost writer on the convention that we are dealing with here. And, uh, it's really just a little convention. It has about six or seven paragraphs or articles, as you call it. And there's really just one article, two, that is relevant. The others are preambles and uh, statements. But um, in uh, 1946, uh, United Nations, uh, there was a resolution uh, saying what should be known that genocide is an international crime. And this is actually what was um, once again affirmed by the Georgic versus Germany. Because as I said, he had nothing to do with Germany really, apart from the fact that he could stay here legally. 
uh, but his deeds didn't have anything with Germany to do, and still he could be prosecuted here. Saying that it is an international crime means that the person who commits such crimes cannot be sure in any country, cannot be, um, at least not in any civilized country, uh, should always be tried wherever he is met. In 1948, the United Nations agreed on the convention. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it comes into into existence because here was, there may be special conditions, but here was a condition that at least 20 uh, countries should have um, agreed on the convention. And it didn't happen until three years later, maybe that was quick, I wouldn't know about that. But the reason why it really didn't mean anything legally was that there were, there were some states who affirmed the convention, took it into their local le legislation on a very, very late time. You can see it, the Soviet uh, Republic didn't do it until 56. Well, that was very quick uh, compared to the United Kingdom. They didn't move themselves into it until uh, 1970. China at 83, and then the most powerful state in the world, uh, United States, they didn't do it until uh, 88. It is said that the political background for that actually was that um, uh, they didn't want uh, any of their nationals to have the risk to be prosecuted in another country. And that was why uh, they didn't um, confirm uh, it until 1988. Now 100, about 140 states, which really is most of the states in the world, uh, are part of the convention. Now, um, what is in this Article 2? Um, it says it has four different uh, acts that may be um, a genocide. It has uh, start, as you can see, any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, or religious group such as and there I'll just make a stop because once you can see, it says the intent, and this is what many of the higher ranking people have said. Well, we didn't have the intent. We didn't know what was going on, kind of the flaw with the soldiers. And of course that has to be proved before you can be guilty. It says killing members of a group causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group, of the group is of course those who are exposed to the genocide, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life, cal calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. That was what happened to the Armenians and to the Hebreos, that they just pushed people out into the de uh, desert, saw to that they couldn't get back, and then of course they would die. Or as the third, third, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, and also forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. I've made this note saying that uh, it's not political killings, a genocide, formally speaking at least, is not if you suddenly decide that you want to uh, to kill or to impose uh, any other destruction on a group. If you say you want to do it on all communists and you want to do it on all extreme right wings or anything like that. And um, it uh, was probably because the uh, um, Soviet Union didn't, didn't want that. Now, when you have this Article 2, as you can see, then I'm sure that most of you have seen a, a legal article before and you would at uh, once in your head say, well, now what, um, uh, how do we understand this and that? And therefore, 
The answer is just like with other uh, legal rules that uh, the interpretation um, are up to the courts. And I can say, take three points there. The first one is that the part target, targeted must be significant enough to have an impact on the group as a whole. That means that if you kill just a few people, then it couldn't be a genocide. Of course, um, it must be um, so that you, it could be said that now you are really make an impact on the group. Like with the Herero people, uh, where we have information that it was about 80% of the group that were being uh, exterminated. Therefore, and that's the second point, uh, that the numeric size, of course, is important, but it's not decisive, because it could be that you killed maybe 20 of the leaders, and that might uh, theoretically also be a genocide. And then, of course, what I uh, have mentioned before, it's the possible extent of the perpetrator's activity, control, and reach. About the courts, I'll say briefly, just to take it up, that um, the preference is that it is in the court where the crime was committed. Very often that doesn't happen because it still may be the head of state who has the rule, or maybe the, the country is in such a state that they can't cope with this big task to, to have an international uh, court. And therefore, very often you see it uh, in other places. Uh, we have the International Criminal <coughs> Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which is an ad hoc court, meaning that it's a court that has just been opened for that specific case. And by one or two years, all the cases have been tried. Then there is the International Criminal Court, which is the ICC, and they are the court, it's the court that is uh, trying uh, the case against Charles Taylor. And many pe uh, pedagogical things, so to speak, is being done because with a delay of 30 uh, minutes, uh, the whole of the, uh, of the courts, uh, all the court sessions are being transferred to Liberia so that all the persons uh, the inhabitants of Liberia have the possibility to sit and see what happened in The Hague. Then there is uh, the International uh, Court of Justice, and that uh, International Court of Justice is really when the countries are part, and you will see it in the Peace Palace in The Hague also. Then we have the Municipal Municipal courts, and that was, for example, the, the uh, case with Georgic version versus um, Germany. And then you can read about the Danish uh, court in the little pamphlet. Now, I actually, I come to where I want you to be active and interactive, because uh, a person called, a professor called Robert Stanton, he uh, made uh, a s statement uh, in 1996, published in the, a journal called, uh, called Genocide Watch. And he said, I can make a diagnosis and saying when these genocides, when they kind of uh, grow out into the air and what are the stages. And you can see here behind me that first it's the classification People are divided into us and them. The symbolization, uh, when combined with hatred, symbols may be forced upon unwilling members. I don't have to uh, ask you to recall the Jewish star during the Second World War as the place here. Then it's uh, dehumanization. It's saying, well, these pigs, these vermins, uh, and you know, you might hear that, some people saying about it about another pe people. Of course, that doesn't have to mean it's the start of a genocide, but you have to look for it. 
Then there is the organization. You can't just have uh, a few killers around, uh, but you have to make some kind of uh, organization. That's special army units or militias that would often be trained. Then there is a polarization. That's when you suddenly have hate uh, broadcasts spreading into society in, in speaking or in, um, in writing um, uh, propaganda against a group. Then there is at the sixth the preparation when you identify the victims and kind of separate them out of the uh, society. And then there is the extermination. And you know, extermination is a word you use when you, when you kill flies or rats or anything else. It's not a genocide, but if you can sell it, if the people who have the power can kind of sell it to the people by saying it's an extermination, or for instance, people who are, who are not, um, uh, who are debile, who uh, uh, have no wits or things, or uh, instances like that. And then, of course, we have, once they have been committed, then we have the denial that the perpetrators, they say they never did such a thing, they never committed any crime. Now, um, I can tell you that in 2008, Madeleine Albright is the co-chairman of uh, a task force against, um, against uh, uh, genocide. Uh, so she, uh, now she always, uh, she also um, have these stages. And uh, I will very quickly, if I uh, go uh, through them, and that's going to be the last I'll say, um, say what is the proposal to do, what can you do if you have any of these, of these signs? You just, no, just like having a flu, what can we do once we have uh, any of the symptoms? The first one with the classification. Uh, there Stanton proposes that the main preventive measure at this early stage is to develop universalistic institutions that uh, transcend divisions. I think this institute in which we are here is such an example. And the second uh, he proposes to combat symbolization, hate symbols can be legally forbidden as can hate speech. <coughs> there, of course, in our uh, countries, we um, would come into a ceiling of freedom of speech and others, but in order to battle uh, the genocide that may be um, that may be uh, necessary. The third one is uh, the dehumanization, and there the local leaders should go in. They should condemn hate speech and make it culturally unacceptable. And uh, leaders who incite genocide, they should be banned from the international society. They should have their foreign finance, finances frozen. I'm sure there may be a lot of different uh, meanings upon that. With the organization, with these special army, army units, um, the Stanton um, um, statement suggests that the UN should impose arms embargoes on the governments and uh, create commissions to investigate violations. So you see, you more and more take the international society in it. The polarization um, uh, may mean that you have to internationally provide security protection for moderate leaders. We have them around uh, here, for instance, the Nobel Prize winner in China. We have uh, Aung Sung, who is uh, I see many of you are, are nodding. Uh, and of course it was at the time with Martin Luther King, he was always under protection. Um, if victims are identified and separated, then the genocide is uh, fully uh, developing and then it's time for the international societies 
to uh, declare a genocide emergency. We have not seen it so far. I was talking about uh, the four in Sudan, and people say, well, this is awful, it shouldn't be done. We're talking about uh, that report that was given last Friday in uh, Geneva about what, what happens in Congo, uh, but no one says, well, we, now we have a genocide emergency, the whole of the international society must uh, work. So uh, at the extermination, it's recommended that there is a rapid and overwhelming armed intervention. I haven't seen that so far in any country uh, with the real purpose to stop genocide. So I think that prevention of genocide is a most difficult thing. And you may have noted that I didn't give you any clue in order to say this is the way we can prevent it. Because I don't think that the, the threat of uh, being prosecuted by some international court is enough to keep these perpetrators away from doing what they're doing. So we have to provide a better world in other ways. Thank you. <laughs>